Good evening to you, and as always, let me start by welcoming you, one and all, very warmly to our worship of God here this Sunday evening. Uh, it makes a big difference when we have the doors open and uh, you don't have to book in advance and you can choose where you sit and just lovely to see you all here this evening and delighted as well to be able to welcome you as you join us on the line tonight. Uh, we don't take your presence with us in that manner for granted. Uh, we're just delighted that uh, although you may not otherwise have been able to gather with us, you are at least able to share in this way with us tonight. We hope that you will feel very much a part of our worship as we bring that to the Lord tonight. Let's then join with one another to worship God and join in the singing of one of the psalms to his praise as our opening praise tonight. Oh, come and let us to the Lord. Let us worship God. Well, let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Uh, God in heaven, we do uh, adore you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the mystery of your own infinite, glorious being, way beyond our capacity to comprehend, but everything you've made known about yourself makes it clear to us that there is a reality about your being there that is the very essence of life itself and the very foundation upon which all the universe is built and all history flows. And we gladly bow in spirit before the majesty 
of your own presence. Glad that we're able to take words that were first penned millennia ago in the knowledge that what our forebears and the faith knew you to be is the same today. You don't grow weary, you don't grow tired, you don't grow weak, you remain the same from one generation on to another. You are that great, mighty creator God by whom all things are made. You simply spoke the word and it was done and you continue in that same manner to speak your word into succeeding generations of your people and into the succeeding generations of history. It is your story ultimately, the sovereign activity of a gracious God as you work out your own eternal purpose and how glad we are, living God, for the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ, your Son, that through what you have accomplished in him, that purpose is now indeed guaranteed of fulfillment. And how glad we are, living God, that it's not dependent upon ourselves at all, that our forgiveness and our renewal and our ultimate sharing in that resurrection to eternal life is not contingent at all upon our performance, but is rooted absolutely in a work that has already been done on our behalf by your Son. And we therefore gladly come into your presence to worship you, not only as our great creator, the one from whom every breath that we breathe derives, but we gladly acknowledge you to be our savior God as well, the God who has come to our rescue, the God who has entered into this world and done for us what we could never do ourselves and done it comprehensively. And now you bid us rest in the finished work of your son and rejoice together in uh, the privilege that you give to us of being your sons and daughters in Christ your Son. And therefore we seek to bring to you again our praise tonight. Our desire, Father, is always that we might meet with yourself. We don't simply gather for some formal routine of piety. It is with the express and exclusive desire, living God, that we should meet with yourself, that we should be able to pour out our hearts to you and discover that long before we were doing that, you were pleased to pour out your heart to us. Would you make yourself known to us, living God, in every aspect of our praise, in the prayers that we bring, in the reading and preaching of your word, come, living God, by your Holy Spirit, and make yourself known to us this evening. May the glory be yours as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, if you have the Bible to hand, uh, we're going to be turning to the scripture now, and uh, Sandra's going to come and read it for us. The reading tonight is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Great, thank you. Um, you'd have seen there the, um, just before Sandra read, the, um, the reference to the YouVersion um, app that you can get for your mobile phone. Many people do find that a very useful app to have. It means that uh, wherever you are, um, you do have that to hand. 
and can therefore, um, whether you're at the bus stop and have five minutes to spare there, um, you can be turning that up, the, the scripture. Very easy to use. Um, it takes you no time to locate a particular book of the Bible. You don't have to worry about uh, where does that book come in the Bible. You can readily find it. And uh, it uh, can be a, a great convenience uh, in that regard. And it has a lot of um, useful uh, accessories with it. Um, Bible reading plans um, just are geared to where you're at, the stage you're at, and so on. So um, that may be something that you want to uh, take a note of if you haven't already utilized that. Um, if you're watching online, we, we do have resources for children. We do have them here as well in the hard copy. Um, they are, as always, on the website. Uh, go to the um, the tab, the right-hand tab that says resources. Click down there on Sunday School, and you'll find that uh, uh, the worksheets are there uh, flagged up for you and you can get them. Uh, we do have hard copies here if you want um, and you can use them and uh, hopefully that that will enable um, families to be able to share together in learning from scripture and uh, the opportunity simply to apply ourselves to the, the same scripture and uh, at whatever level may be appropriate for us to be learning. And uh, the theme tonight on the, the worksheet is simply flagged up, be strong and you'd have got that from the reading. We'll come back to that in a moment or two, but um, you'll appreciate that that's largely the, the reason why we're going to sing the, the next song, or couple of songs. Uh, strength, is, uh, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Uh, we draw our strength from Him, and we'll just go straight on from singing that into the singing of the song, No, Not By Might, in other words, our might or our power, but by the Spirit of God. He's He's the strong one, and he comes to be strong for us. So let's join as we um, wait upon the Lord uh, in singing these two songs together now.
Lord, as we turn to the, the scriptures, let's take a moment to bow in prayer and seek God's own instruction of us tonight. Let us pray. God, our Father, uh, we do want to learn. We want to be good learners, and we need the tutelage of your own Holy Spirit. He who authored this word will be himself its best interpreter. And therefore, would you grant that that may indeed be the reality that he would come and simply take his word and, and open its truth to our hearts and then apply it to our lives in a way that will see a transformation that is to your lasting praise and glory. Meet with us, living God, we pray. Help us. Uh, you know each and every one of us. You know our circumstances. You know our needs. You know our burdens. And our desire, Father, is that in our lives we may indeed bring glory to yourself. So would you help us and meet with us now for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, I hesitate to suggest that the Apostle Paul uh, would wish to have any sort of identification with a children's song, but at the risk of offending the Apostle Paul, um, it is, I think, uh, the case that chapters 1 and 2 particularly of this letter that he writes late on in his life to this younger colleague of his, Timothy, who is pastor of a church in Ephesus, um, the first two chapters are really best expressed in summary form in the children's song that we sometimes sing. Some of you may be less than others or less enthusiastically than some of the children do the song simply be bold be strong for the lord your god is with you uh, i will not be afraid no 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 and um, no adult in their right mind is going to shout that out but if you're a child you shout it out because you believe it there's no way that i'm going to be afraid and uh, chapter one really is is paul basically saying to Timothy, as we've seen through the course of the past few weeks, he's saying, be bold, and explains why he can be bold, and why it's important that he is bold, and how that can happen. And chapter two, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out, you just need to read what's there in front of you. He's basically saying, be strong as well. And if you want to know why uh, and how, then he would probably say in summary form, as the whole Bible says, for the Lord your God is with you. That's, that's how you're going to be strong. And uh, so if, you, if you're looking for a kind of short summary of chapters 1 and 2 of 2 Timothy, there you have it. It's pretty easy. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. And the consequence of that is you're able to say, come what may, in your circumstances, in your life and in your world, uh, I am not afraid. No, no, no. Now, um, we're going to look at it in just a little bit more detail than that, obviously, this evening, because it is, I hope, um, the desire in your heart that you should be strong, uh, in the sense that your life leaves its mark upon others. Your desire, I guess, is that you don't want simply to live out a mediocre, middle-of-the-road life that goes nowhere, does nothing, affects no one, and when you die, um, really, there's not a lot to show for your living. Uh, we have within us that, that instinct that we were made for something a little bit more than that. An instinct that tells us we are significant, that we do matter and we are meant to matter. And our problem is not really figuring out that we are meant to matter. We're, our problem very often is we, we don't quite know how to translate that into a reality. And therefore, when Paul says here to Timothy, um, you, my son, be strong, there's a part of us that, that recoils a little bit because we think, well, yeah, um, how on earth can I be strong? Because I am actually more conscious of my weakness than of any strength that I may have. It is an unusual person. There are some folk like this, I know, but it is an unusual person that is just super confident of their own strength. Uh, I, I remember when I was minister in Davidson's Mains, where there were um, some very high flyers in the business world, some very high flyers in the banking world, people who had attained a very eminent position. And I remember chatting with them quite early in my time, and, and they're saying to me, 
everyone thinks that, that I, I am a really confident person and I'm a really successful person, but, but actually that's not the reality. I'm, I'm just so conscious of my own weaknesses. I'm conscious of my own foibles. I'm conscious of my own failures. I'm conscious of the ways in which I do get it wrong. And if, if there's any strength that I have, it's simply the ability to cover that up half the time. But basically, I'm weak. And Paul is writing to a guy, Timothy, whom he knows is conscious of his own weakness. Uh, he is a relatively shy young man. Uh, he is someone who possibly struggled a little bit with uh, an element of being uh, inferior. When he looked around other people, he would automatically assume that they maybe were, were better debaters than he was, that they knew the Bible better than he did, that they were this, that, and the next better than him. Uh, and always, therefore, um, having that, that rather defensive position. And Paul is exhorting him as a pastor, but as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the desire that his life should indeed be one in which he experiences and enjoys the promise of life that he speaks about in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, that life in all its fullness, um, he, he encourages Timothy to be strong. And uh, what the following verses highlight for us are these three things. First of all, in verse 1, where you get that strength from. And that's obviously important as the starting point. Um, it doesn't matter what else. If you, if you haven't got that strength to start with, um, nothing else he's going to say is really going to help you at all. Where do you get that strength from? If you are someone who is intrinsically, inherently weak, right? And, and that's me. Um, I'm quite unashamed to, to let you know um, that I am a weak individual. You may not think that. Uh, in fact, there was a, a, a child who was hanging around at the end of the service and said, uh, you must feel like the president when you stand up here. Um, and you know, she came around and had a go of being behind her. I said, well, what does it feel like? And she said, terrifying. And, and that, that's it, yeah. It, it is terrifying to be up here, particularly of someone who, who is conscious of weakness. And, and I'm not alone. I guess if I were to put to uh, you, put your hand up. If, if there's a sense of weakness, most of you would probably put your hand up in one regard or another. We don't feel that we are the, the kind of strong and mighty in the service of God. And so what Paul says in verse 1 is, is very instructive for us. Very practical again, because it's a very practical letter. Where do you get that strength? And what he highlights here is um, a couple of things. First of all, he reminds us that it is always in relationship with Jesus. It is a relationship with Jesus. Um, it's not Timothy's strength. Um, it is a strength that is his in Christ Jesus. And in the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, when that phraseology is used, uh, in Christ Jesus, um, it is always meaning in relationship with. It is because of your relationship with Jesus that all that is true of him becomes true of you. Um, and that's what's meant by being in Jesus. It means being, um, in, in kind of Facebook terms, in a relationship with him. Um, and that's always the, the kind of starting point for folk. Are you in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, not do you know a few things about him? Do you have an admiration for him? Uh, you're going to vote for him at, uh, you know, when it comes to the big day, but are you in a relationship with him? It's, it's not a complicated thing. Uh, Jesus is for real. Uh, this real individual uh, whose, whose life is the most documented life in ancient history um, suffered and was crucified, was uh, buried, and then um, remarkably rose from the dead. He is alive. Um, that's the testimony. That's the staggering testimony. That's the uh, uh, astonishing, unique testimony about this person, Jesus, that God himself and the whole scriptures say, examine it. See for yourself. It is the reality. It may be unique. It may be unusual. It may be unprecedented, but it is the reality. This Jesus, about whom we know so much, is risen. He is alive, and he is someone, therefore, with whom you can have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with someone who's dead and buried 2,000 years ago, but you can have a relationship with someone who's alive, at work, who speaks, who makes himself known, who communes, who leads, who guides, who directs, who teaches, who helps. Uh, you can have a relationship with such an individual. 
I discovered that for myself um, something like 45 plus years ago. And I've never had occasion to doubt the reality of that. It has been that r relationship with the risen living Jesus that has been foundational for every aspect of life. There's nothing more real than that. And that's what Paul is pointing to, a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, that's where you've got to be strong, in relationship with him. It has nothing to do with your own intellectual capacity. It has nothing to do with the gifts that you bring. It has nothing to do with your own physical health. It has nothing to do with your own moral well-being and your own moral capacity and your own moral uh, eagerness, enthusiasm, and intention. Nothing to do with that at all. It is a strength that derives pure and simple from your relationship with the risen Jesus because he is strong. And so alongside that relationship with the risen Jesus... Um, there is also always to be a reliance upon the risen Jesus. And that really is what Paul is talking about here when he says, you then, my son, be strong uh, in the grace, that's to say the, the generous giving from Jesus of that which you don't deserve at all, but he's pleased to give and to give in abundance the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You rely on him. It was Hudson Taylor, the uh, founder of uh, what is now the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, originally the China Inland Mission. Uh, Hudson Taylor um, once put it like this. He said, all God's giants, that's to say the people who kind of um, we look up to and admire because of the, the things that they did, we think, wow, I mean, they, they are achievers. They have done something for the Lord. All God's giants, he said, have been weak men and women who did great things for God because they reckoned on his being with them. That was the truth um, about them. That's what explained why they were able to be so strong in such a manner that they did great things for God. That's one of the benefits of reading Christian biography. Read some of these books. See what God is able to do with pretty ordinary individual, pretty messed up individuals, pretty flawed individuals, people who are kind of awkward and cussed and, and uh, just are, uh, you know, as flawed as the rest of us. God using them in, in ways that are simply stunning. How do you explain that? Well, um, Hudson Taylor puts his finger on it exactly. That's, he's not coming up with anything new here. He's simply saying what the scriptures say. They did great things because they reckoned not on facing the situation in their own strength, that was the last thing that was on their mind, but they knew that he was with them. And they were saying, Lord, it's yours, your problem, your situation, you deal with it, because there's no way I can handle it. You've got to deal with it. And he does. You open the door to him and say, all yours. Then his glance is, okay, I'll, uh, I'll deal with it. And, and God, who is mighty, is able to, to deal with it. You get a, a brilliant illustration of that, instantly in the book of Judges. You may want to turn that up. Um, and if you've got the U app, um, U version app, you'll be able to do that very easily. Judges chapter six, where um, you know the story. Um, the, uh, the the people of Israel uh, at this particular time are a people who have been invaded every year by the Midianites, um, and the Midianites are basically the baddies. Um, and the Midianites, uh, there are loads of them. Um, it's, it's like uh, a, a swarm of locusts. There are, there are so many of them that, that they, they couldn't be counted. And they just swept in every summer, every harvest time, and they, they simply took all the crops that had grown and, and said thank you very much and made off with them. And, uh, and the people of Israel had, had no answer to that. It was terrifying. The sheer uh, scale of the Midianite invasion, the Midianite hordes that came in. And uh, in that situation, the Lord comes and he sits down one day um, beside uh, a guy called Midian. Verse 11 of chapter 6, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah, 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 dear me, uh, that belonged to Joash the Abbey Ezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites, hid, hiding away. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And, and Gideon immediately has two problems with that. Uh, and he's quite unashamed in, in telling the Lord what his two problems are. Number one, uh, it doesn't exactly look like you are with us because uh, we just get swamped every year. 
by the Midianites. Uh, we just seem to be left to ourselves. It doesn't kind of look like uh, you are with us. That's how he gone. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. It doesn't look like it. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. He said he's um, at least got a, a bit of a brass neck because he's prepared to stand up to the Lord and, and kind of challenge the Lord when the Lord comes and says, uh, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. And so his second problem with what the Lord has said is, um, you've got the wrong guy. Because if there is one thing, Gideon is saying, if there's one thing that is true about me, I am not a mighty warrior. And he, he then explains to the Lord why that is the reality. You know, and, and the Lord, who surely knows everything, surely should have known that about Gideon, that he is not a mighty warrior. Uh, he says, um, uh, I, I come from, uh, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. So I have a track record, he said. I have a lousy family. Uh, we are weak, we are feeble, we are small. And within that whole clan and within that whole family, um, I'm the weakest and the smallest and the feeblest of the lot. You've just got the wrong guy. And the Lord says, I haven't got the wrong guy. When I call you a mighty warrior, it's not because you're a mighty warrior. It's because I'm with you and because I'm a mighty warrior, says the Lord. That's why you're a mighty warrior, because I'm now with you. And, and I'm sending you. So you go and you do the business because I am with you. I'm a mighty warrior. And therefore, because I'm that and I'm with you, then that's who you are now. You're a mighty warrior. Because of the strength that you have in the Lord himself. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Same stuff again. Gideon was probably singing it after um, a, a few years or the, the equivalent. Um, that's the whole burden of the scriptures continually. Um, it is the exercise of faith whereby we are looking to the Lord on the basis of what he has said to be the truth about himself and his relationship with us. He has said, as you trust in me, I will be with you, always. Right? That's the bottom line. And that is a massive, massive promise that is made there in the scriptures. And it's underlined more than any other promise in the scriptures. And the command there were to be not afraid is underlined more times than any other command in the scriptures. The two belong together. That is the promise that is given to those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am with you. And that's the Lord, the Lord who framed the whole universe, the Lord who, who is mighty, uh, able to do all things, that God is with you. That is the reality, the bottom line reality about you as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever you are, whatever family you come from, whatever your background is, whatever your intellectual capacity may be, whatever your track record may be, whatever your moral capabilities are, whatever it may be, that is the bottom line truth about you. Whatever may be true about you, the Lord is with you. And he is a mighty warrior. And therefore, you can face every situation in that confidence that uh, what may be way beyond your pay grade is not beyond his pay grade. He's well able to handle it all, well able to address it all. And we are therefore bidden always simply to, to step out in faith and to trust him in every situation, not to play safe and kind of retreat into a safe, comfortable scenario where we, we don't really have to rely on the Lord. We just kind of uh, hang back but to put ourselves into those situations in pursuit of his call upon our lives where if that's not the truth, then, then we're just down the tubes completely. That's what Gideon is, is being bidden by the Lord to do. I'm sending you, says the Lord. This is the truth about you. I am with you. I am a mighty warrior. Therefore, you're a mighty warrior, so go do the business. And Gideon takes clearly a little bit of persuading, but he, he does go. And uh, he goes with quite a large number of troops, obviously, to start with, because uh, safety in numbers, he thinks, you know, it's good having the Lord, but it's also nice to have a, a whole army behind me. And the Lord says, hey, uh, get rid of the army, uh, because you don't need the army when you've got me. Uh, I, I am an army myself. I'm a mighty, mighty warrior. I, I can handle it all myself. And so the army is, is whittled down to a tiny little number, and Gideon is bidden by the Lord to go out and step out and trust him that uh, because the Lord is with him, the Lord will do great things. The Lord did great things 
in and through his life. And he remains the same. Now, that's what Timothy is being urged by Paul. Live your life like that, he says. You want to enjoy that life that Jesus has given? Then learn to trust that bottom line promise that has been given to you. The Lord has said, I am with you. We sing it every Christmas. Emmanuel. We love singing all these Christmas songs. And, and the number of times that phrase Emmanuel, that word Emmanuel, that name Emmanuel comes in is, is, uh, is massive. And every time it's the Lord saying, yeah, that's the truth. That's what's happened in the coming of Jesus into this world. Who is he? He is Emmanuel. He is the one who brings the presence of God into our experience. The Lord God is with you. Um, so go, go live like that, says Paul to Timothy. That's where you get your strength. Verse 2. Paul goes on to explain why you need that strength. And what he says here obviously has uh, uh, a specific reference to Timothy in the role and the responsibilities that he has as a pastor in Ephesus. But um, despite the fact that that's his situation and it's to that situation that Paul is writing, that's not a good reason for you now to switch off and think, well, it doesn't really apply to me because I'm not a pastor. And by the way, I have no intention of ever being a pastor so I can kind of switch off and you know, tell me when you've got on to the next bit of the Bible. Not at all. What he says here is applicable in a more general sense to every believer. And the essence of what he's saying to Timothy here is that your call under God is to pass on that message faithfully and clearly to succeeding generations in such a way that that good news about Jesus will indeed be communicated clearly, rightly, and faithfully so that succeeding generations, so that succeeding ripples of God's grace may indeed flow out from you. And you'll see that that's what he's on about here. Why do you need that strength? Why? Because uh, what you are to do, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And you'll see there that what Paul is pointing to effectively is a, a kind of four-generation pattern um, to the perspective that uh, Timothy is to have and that we are to have four generations because it starts with the Apostle Paul and he is communicating to Timothy, he is teaching Timothy, he is tutoring Timothy, he has taught Timothy, encouraged Timothy, helped disciple Timothy. Now Timothy is himself to, to teach others, to teach reliable people, to teach those um, who are going themselves to be able then to teach a generation beyond them as well. So Paul, in his thinking, understands that, that his role isn't, isn't fulfilled simply by passing on the message to Timothy and leaving it in his hands, but rather doing so in such a way that Timothy understands that that's going to be his responsibility as well to ensure that it's passed on to reliable people who themselves will pass it on to others also. And it's quite an interesting um, perspective that, uh, again, here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, 2, 2, 2, um, that Paul underlines because it is, it is a biblical perspective whereby um, very, very often it is in the fourth generation that the real fruit of an initial work of God finds its truest fulfillment and its richest fulfillment. Um, part of the reason for that, I think, is that by the time it gets to that fourth generation, the first generation's dead. And so it's not going to go to their heads that, hey, you know, that's what I did. They're dead and gone, and they don't see the real fruit of what God was doing through them as that, that grace, that ministry is passed on and exercised by them, fourth generation. So um, you get a really good example of that in the Old Testament with Boaz and Ruth, and we, we kind of uh, uh, know and understand that. Very simple, very important, but uh, very significant narrative there in those four chapters in the book of Ruth. Boaz and Ruth, um, two very different individuals, one coming from a, a very godly heritage, the other coming from from uh, an entirely pagan heritage and coming together as those who together have, have um, taken refuge in the Lord God. They have looked to him, they've trusted in him, they've, um, they've embraced him, they are in relationship with the living God together. And um, wonderful story of, of godly individuals, the exercise of faith, but, but the real fruit 
of the faith that each of them independently exercises. Ruth, in that initial step, a big, big step in coming back from the land of Moab to a country and a culture that she knows little about, the land of Israel, coming back to that land from Moab, taking that step out of darkness, out of the land of deadness, into the realm of light and life. That's a big step of faith, and it's recognized as such by Boaz and by others, and Boaz himself exercising that faith under God to do the costly thing and take on this, uh, this lady. And together, they, they have a child called Obed. And Obed is the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David. And with David, uh, the, whole, the whole drift of the people of Israel is, is reversed. And a people who had been on a downward, downward slide frighteningly so. Um, in David's reign, suddenly by the grace of God, they are raised up again. And um, there is a connection between the two. David's great um, ministry under God it has its roots really back in Boaz and Ruth and the faith that they exercise as they pass on to their children and their children's children and then beyond their own death, their children's children, children. Um, that's the sort of thing that Paul is on about here. And Boaz and Ruth are dead by the time that David is, is being used by God like that. But eternity reveals to us that's the perspective. And that certainly is the perspective that, that Paul has here, that uh, the, the concern that we have is, is, is not that we should be magnified, not that people should laud us for the, the faith that we exercise and the things that we do, but rather that we should see that as we simply go about the business which the Lord has called us to of passing on that message to others who will themselves pass it on to others, then the Lord himself wonderfully takes that up and almost certainly way beyond your lifetime there will be a fruit born of that. And, uh, and that's a, an enormous privilege, but it's a perspective that Paul is on about here. And you need strength to do that. Uh, you need the strength, as I understand what Paul is saying here, first of all, to um, study yourself, to study very patiently. Um, what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, says Paul. He's reminding Timothy, I think, of the, the place that there was in Timothy's life of simply being a student of the word of God. And as not least a young man, far from thinking that he knew it all, being ready to be taught, ready to be guided, ready to be directed in his thinking, in his living, in his perspectives, in his understanding of ministry, ready to be guided by one who is able to teach him. You need a certain strength to do that. Um, anyone can kind of flit in and out and you know, drop in and drop out and just kind of, when they choose, get the benefit of, of maybe a sermon here and a sermon there and, and that sort of thing. You need a certain strength to apply yourself and say, I will be a student. I will be there at the place of worship, morning and evening, and through the week as well, to study and to learn. That's a, that's a certain strength that is required. And Paul is, is highlighting that. Um, it, it's a particular type of strength to, to stick in with that. The arduous, demanding, sometimes challenging task of being a good learner. You need strength to instruct others prayerfully. To be able to recognize that there's, there's a limited number of people that you are going to be able to invest sufficient time in 
getting alongside them as a friend, getting alongside them as someone who, who begins to understand them as individuals. There's a, a limited number of people that you're going to be able to teach and instruct and encourage and help. And, and you need the strength to be able to discern what those, those particular friendships are going to be where you are to pour your time and your energies and to be strong enough to give that time to other people. Sometimes we, we spread ourselves so thinly that we, we are not really able to instruct others fully. Um, it's one of the reasons why we, we pattern our life as a fellowship as we do because the, there is no way that one individual whom we call the minister can pastor in this sort of way a fellowship of 150 people and more. It just can't be done unless, unless the guy spreads himself so thinly that uh, everyone just kind of gets a, a small flavor of it. Just, it's not going to happen. And what Paul is talking about here is, is learn to discern those whom God is, is bringing into your path with whom you are going to be able to, to develop the sort of friendship that means you will be a mentor, you will be an instructor, you will be able to teach them, you'll be able to advise them, you'll be able to encourage them, you'll be able to help them as they address their different issues. Um, that's what Paul is on about here. Discern who it is, Timothy, that you need to be concentrating your energies on as a pastor. And uh, that's, that's true for each and every one of us. Let's pause and just be asking the Lord, who are the individuals? Perhaps particularly if you are slightly up in years, right? I'm not going to put a, a number on it, but, but if you're up in years, then... You've had a lot, of, a lot of time where the Lord has been teaching you. You have a lot of experience. Uh, you have a lot of experience of the grace of God and the word of God. And, and where that's the case, so who are the individuals that you are under God called to invest that sort of time and that sort of energy with teaching them in this sort of deliberate, constructive way that will ensure that they in turn will be able and will be eager to do exactly the same in the lives of others. Uh, I, I can think back to my student days and remain profoundly grateful for some older couples in the congregation who, who really took um, both myself and Susan under their wing uh, without, you know, with, with no sort of uh, sense of being brought under their wing. They, they just were so warm, so welcoming, so um, befriending, so hospitable that, that they, they mentored us in many ways. And that's such a formative thing. We were talking about this a little bit this morning at the, um, the service in terms of uh, the, the, the ministry that is exercised through the Sunday school and through the, the youth group uh, the latter particular, where the, those sort of relationships as, as youngsters move into their adult years. That's where it began with Timothy, just at that sort of formative period of his life. And, uh, uh, and the Apostle Paul teaching him, shaping a whole life that would be used in ways far beyond what Timothy himself could have uh, anticipated or imagined. Um, and, um, and that's what he's on about here. There's a strength that is needed not only to study patiently, but also to instruct prayerfully. And um, a strength um, involved in equipping others purposefully. Not just instructing them um, and encouraging them so that they, they comprehend more and more fully the truths of the gospel, but along with that, equipping them with a sense of what God is doing, that purpose of God down through the generations so that they, they are not only eager to share in that work, but they understand what that work is and their part in it. 
and are conscious of being equipped then themselves to fulfill precisely that sort of ministry. Um, that's, that's the sort of strength that Paul is on about. That's why verse 2 follows verse 1. Be strong in uh, the grace that is uh, ours in Christ Jesus. Why? Because what you really need to do is pass that message on in this sort of manner. Now, he then goes on in verses um, 3 to 6 to provide illustrations of how you display that strength, what that actually works out as in practical terms. And tempting as it is for me to embark on that at 22 minutes past 7, uh, I, I'm going to resist the temptation because um, I, I don't want to rush through this. Um, we're going to come back to this next Sunday evening. But you'll see that there are these three pictures there. They are um, not just random pictures that Paul has plucked out uh, of thin air as being yeah, a good illustration. Uh, very deliberate. Because in these three pictures, each of them provides a different perspective, first of all, you will see, on what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Soldier, why? Because it is a battle into which you're called. Um, don't for a minute think that it's, it's just a bed of roses. You are called as a follower of Jesus into what is a battle, and it is a real battle. It is a very costly battle. It is a very dangerous battle. It is a very difficult and demanding battle. It is a battle. You are a soldier. That's the first thing. It gives a, a different perspective. An athlete, it's uh, akin to a race that has to be run. And uh, there isn't room in a race for dawdling. There isn't room in a race for just kind of looking around and enjoying the scenery. That's not what you're there for. There is an aim, there is a finish in view, and everything hinges on your heading in that direction. It's a race, and as a farmer, what you're called to in that life following Jesus uh, is a work that is harvesting the land, is sharing in the work of God whereby there is a harvest of people that God is gathering to himself. The, the illustrations used regularly in one way or another by Jesus. And all of these different illustrations give a, a perspective on what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Each of them also, you will see, points to different, a different context in which that strength is going to be required. So as a soldier... Paul is pointing to the communal context. You are not on your own. You are part of an army. No soldier fights battles on their own. That's not how it works. It is a together thing. And as a soldier, you have to think communally. You have to think and understand where you fit in in that communal picture that is called an army and how you have a part to play that is part of the whole picture. And if you don't play your part as others play their part, then the whole thing is, is going to collapse. It is a communal context. As an athlete, Paul is highlighting the, the personal or the individual context in which you are going to need that strength. In your individual walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to need to be strong because you are going to be assaulted. You are going to be tempted. You are going to be faced by all sorts of things that have come your way. And you're going to need to be strong enough as an individual to know how to cope with and handle them. And the farmer, it is a cultural context. There are different sorts of farming. And if you're a farmer, you have to know what the land is that you are farming. Because if you don't know and understand the land, if you don't understand the context, that particular culture in which you are set, you will go about it in the wrong way. You need to know and understand where it is that you are now called to farm. And in the same way, you and I need to understand the specific context in which we are to go about our work. What are the particular features of that culture? 
Um, and how do we go about farming it? And so there is, uh, in each case, a, a different perspective on what it is to be a follower of Jesus. In each case, there is a different context in which that strength is required. And in each case, there is a um, highlighted for us a, a, a different aspect of the strength that is required. What does it mean to be strong? It means, first of all, you are resolved to please your commanding officer. It means, secondly, you are resolved to obey the rules. And it means, thirdly, you are resolved to work hard. Now, that's as much as we're going to cover this evening. But that's, that's what he's on about here. That's what being strong is going to look like in your life and in your living. If you are going to live that sort of life, whereby generations beyond you are going to look back read your biography, as it were, and wonder what it is that made you such a giant in your day. You never thought of yourself as a giant. What it is about you that enabled you to be used by God in such a way that, that he did great things through you, um, most of which you don't even know half about. What is it that enables you to be strong like that? That's what he's on about here. We'll look at this uh, God willing, next Sunday evening. The soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. And as we bow in closing, uh, in prayer, let's simply take the opportunity to ask the Lord, first of all, to give to us that strength that may mean simply recognizing that our first need is a relationship with Jesus. And if you've never entered into that relationship with Jesus, then even as you bow this evening, there's the opportunity just to do so, to say, Jesus, simply, there's a lot that I've got to learn, but I'm yours. I want to live my life with you. I want to get to know you. I want to follow you. I want to learn from you. I need you. And it may be that without really being too conscious of it. You've drifted into a position where even in relationship with him, you've ceased to rely so much upon him. You, you've learned how to handle things and now rely upon your own innate abilities. And it may be that there are issues in your own life, burdens that you have as you bow before the Lord that you simply want to take the opportunity tonight and say, Lord, I, I can't handle that. I can't resolve that. I don't know how to address that. I don't see a solution to that. And so I need you, Lord. You, the mighty warrior. Would you go with us into the coming days and would you grant us such an awareness of your own presence with us, such an assurance of that, that, that we shall indeed, because we know that you're a great God, and because we've asked great things of you, we will attempt great things for you. Teach us then, living God, that we may be as those who teach others, give us opportunities through this coming week to share the good news about Jesus with others, to pass that message on and enable us to recognize if this is a, an issue for some of us here this evening. Who is it? Who are the people that you mean us to be applying time and energy with, just giving of ourselves in Christ, that they may be encouraged, that they may be built, that they may be strengthened, that they may be nurtured, that they may be shaped. And grant living God that it should be the case in this generation as in others, that as we take those steps of faith like Boaz and Ruth so long ago, there will be fruit born beyond our countenancing in generations still unborn. And this we ask, Lord, for your own namesake. Amen. Well, we um, will come back to those closing verses of the passage that we read uh, next Sunday evening, but uh, we'll take the, the words of Charles Wesley's hymn to exhort one another as we press on in his service. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on.
Go then in that confidence and with that perspective. Go to love and to serve the Lord, and let's pray for one another using the words of the grace that will be on the screen for you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.